Hey, everybody. Welcome to Wealth Wisdom Financial Podcast and YouTube channel. Uh, I am loving doing interviews uh, and meeting some amazing people as we've been, you know, uh, in the financial services world and business owners with the podcast or with the um, coffee shop for so long. We we have seen that there's a lot of people who you know, are actually the ones doing the work and making an impact. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't, I, you know what I say, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. And so we're very selective in who we put on, on this show. Uh, and today we have an amazing uh, person. I've been listening to her podcast, uh, which she's going to talk about, um, but it's Victoria uh, Wick. And she is amazing in that she started from nothing, you know, uh, even coming from another country to here and now is like a celebrity uh, in, in the shopping world. She's actually a jewelry designer um, and also on the Home Shopping Network and, and things like that. And not only that, she's teaching what she has done and how she's accomplished that. Um, and, and it's nothing small of some, you know, hard work that she's done to get there. Some miracles I'm sure that have helped her get there, but where she's at now is over. Uh, let me, let me say the, the, the numbers, um, I think over 500 million in sales, right. For her, um, products. So anyway, I'm excited to have uh, a jewelry designer uh, on our show. And maybe you guys will pick up some gold uh, from her right now. So welcome, Victoria. Thanks for having me, Brandon. Um, just love your show as well. And your casual, you know, conversation t style of, uh, you know, sharing our journey. Love that. Yeah. I think we are very like we are casual and and where we've started we are i mean well, both of us are probably from humble beginnings right uh humble so, is a well understatement yeah, <laughs> i right. would say i would say dire situations <laughs> well and and, uh, and why i liked what you have shared and, and what you've um accomplished is i am a product of a, a single mom right so my mom uh raised me and my sister uh, had, you know, a lot of stuff. She, she was in sales, uh, entrepreneur, uh, I would say, and, and, and all of that. And so I know how hard it is as a single mom starting doing, I mean, just covering the bills, right. Yeah. Uh, let alone, yeah. uh, starting a business. So how, how did you go from, you know, uh, the, the, the single mom world into this and what would you say to to moms and i'm sure you've been asked this question who you know kind of say well all right this is the way it's going to be right well uh first of all my my parents were you know pretty they had a really rough uh beginning here in america i mean mm -hmm. it was actually rougher for them because they had everything when we were in in korea um uh, my father was like a you know we were, I wouldn't say we were super rich, but we were definitely upper middle class back there. When we came yeah. here, all the money got taken away because at that time the country was run by a dictator. So uh, when they froze our accounts, um, he only had 30 bucks. Uh, while we were in transit, they, they froze us. We wow. actually tried to go back, but we couldn't go back. So that's that. And uh, when it came to my, uh, my career, um, I, I was married. I got married. Uh, mm -hmm. at some point. But uh, basically, here's the thing. Um, I think that when you start with no money and no influence, you know, people who have no influence on you, like in my, my parents, neither one of them actually spoke English. They couldn't help mm -hmm. me with my homework or anything after I was like in middle school. Um, yeah. So, you know, they didn't speak English so that I actually had to do everything by myself. And, um, and I had to help my parents raise my four younger siblings. I was 13. And the youngest one was uh, less than a year old, younger than a year old. So mm -hmm. I helped take care of them. You know, I fed them, bathed them, all that stuff. Uh, money was really tight. But I think those beginnings when you don't have anything mm -hmm. is when you really learn how to be resourceful, when you learn how to 
um, you, you just make a decision. Yeah, you don't yeah. have like, uh, you know, I don't know if you play golf or not, but when you go, uh, yeah. the best round of golf, I'm not a go great golfer, but the best round of golf I ever played was when I was in Florida, somebody said, you know, like, hey, let's go play golf. And I said, I don't have any clubs. So we literally went to Walmart and bought one of those $99 packages with, yeah. um, it, ha it had the, ca the golf case, the bag, the whole thing. It came with like six clubs, okay? Uh, an average golfer plays with like 14 clubs. But it came with six clubs. Didn't it? Didn't have a pitching wedge and a sand wedge. It only had one or the other. Yeah. You didn't have to make a whole lot of decisions. You you kind of had to do what you you know. Yeah, you right. Kind of make the best of what you got, right? So I feel like um, those years when I didn't have anything and I had to do so much um, gave me the tools that I needed later in life. For example, for example, I'm gonna you're gonna find this very interesting. Um, when I couldn't speak English, the first days in school, literally, yeah. I, I, I knew how to say hello. That was it. So uh, what happened was I had to draw like a toilet to go to the bathroom to let mm -hmm. my teachers know, you know, where is the bathroom, literally. Um, and, you know, I had to kind of like uh, draw everything out just to be able to like, you know, talk to people. I had no friends. And uh, so initially I drew, I learned to draw faster, more effectively, which parts and what I you know, you don't have to draw the whole bathroom, just have to draw the toilet, right? Yeah. So yeah. um later on in life, um, you know, I was always working two jobs and in my downtime I would paint my drawings. Um, and they were much more emotional. Like th there was like more like therapy. So when I became a jewelry designer, most jewelry designers in America don't know how to draw. You know, they'll mm -hmm. say I like this, I like that or whatever. They they they're not they really don't understand the emotional connection to your ultimate audience. I did that. That was pretty much so the skills I needed just to learn to, to communicate later on became a huge factor in my jewelry designs. So, you know, when I was on HSN for 20 years uh, and I would throw I would show up my drawing, the watercolor drawings, people would just fall in love. I mean, I had people buying my drawings for $2,500 for God's sakes, you know, yeah. but um, so had I come in here, like n n didn't have to learn to speak English or anything, I probably wouldn't have become that that skilled at communicating with my drawings, right? That's that's the first yeah. thing. And the other thing too is um, when you don't understand the language, you really have to learn to read body language. You mm -hmm. have to like learn to listen like several times, try to figure out what they're saying. And so I became like a, a like a stage five listener. The whole time, yeah. like when they say something, it, do they really mean that? Or did I get the, the, the word right? Or, you know, like there was uncertainty on everything. So I became a really great listener. And also feeling, understanding like what it felt like to have nothing, to have people tell you, you're not going to be anybody because you came from a family with no means and you don't have any, I mean, it's America after all, but you still needed money to start a business. You still yeah. needed connections to, you know, make anything happen. You needed all, you know, all these degrees and I didn't have any of it. And so I thought, you know what, as long as I'm going to make no money, um, as long as I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life, I might as well enjoy my life. And that's why I started doing jewelry design as, as a, my entry point into the world of business. So, so, I mean, this, this is really amazing as we work with, business owners and entrepreneurs, uh, there's what I call, and, and you were listening, I was listening to your podcast with a, I think it was, um, I don't know, about coaching and a personal brand. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Something you mentioned was there's a, there's a, a lot of people in that coaching world who maybe uh, are saying the right things, but they haven't actually done anything right right they haven't felt the pain i mean co uh, you have to uh, you know it's interesting because uh, a lot of people have told me you know to coach and they told me like the ma people who do masterminds and i i know i know a lot of people who do it they're like well teach them uh what they need uh but don't tell them how how to do it yeah and i'm like well what is the point of coaching then they already know what they need yep. i mean if you're an entrepreneur right now you, you need two things. You may need a lot more than two, but you need the two things for sure. One is visibility. Yep. And the second thing is money. Yep. And so like, why would I be in, engaged in something to tell them what they need? You know, what they need is pretty obvious. You know, most, most entrepreneurs know that. Yep. So I feel like um, having got, you know, 
being an entrepreneur, this is the one thing I really want everyone to understand. If you're an entrepreneur, 70% of what you do isn't going to work. That's just, yeah. it, that's just how things work. Okay, 70% of what 80, you do isn't going to work. 80% of what you do doesn't really matter. 20% will. Right, but 70% of what you do is not going to work. I mean, think about it, okay? I'm not a real sports person by any means, but if you look at someone like Michael Jordan, um, people say he was one of the greatest. Yeah. Um, at the buzzer, when he when things mattered and, you know, they gave him the Hail Mary shot, yeah. um, he hasn't actually, he's less than 50% there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's about 20, 30%, and that's, you know, that's a Hail Mary shot. Now, um, if you look at somebody just below Michael Jordan's level, I'm sure that you, you guys can come up with a, a lot of them. They're below 20%. Yeah. Um, if you are like a baseball player, you know, if every third time you hit a home run, I mean, you'd be making $50 million a year. You don't. Most people barely basically get on the base about a third of the time. So as an entrepreneur, because you have a great idea and you got a bunch of friends who love you and who want to you know, mm -hmm. do your thing, don't don't translate that into an instant success. You're going to fail. And you know what? Failing is good. It's very, very good for you. You know, my whole my parents failed miserably when they came here. Yeah. But today they all five of their children are incredibly successful, incredibly successful. Um, and their grandchildren are incredibly successful because they they failed, but they never gave up hope. So yeah. when you, um, it, I'll give you another example, okay? I believe in planned failure, um, and, I, and I'm going to explain why. When I go on TV, um, and I, I'm going to talk about the TV just because it's what I know. When I go mm -hmm. on TV, uh, in a one-hour jewelry show, which I own, like I, I'll, do like a, I'll do like eight hours on a day. But let's say on a two-hour block, mm -hmm. each hour we are supposed to uh, present something like uh, 16 styles, 16 different items. Yeah. And we are judged on a dollars per minute basis. So every hour is worth something. You know, depending on the network, every hour is worth several hundred thousand dollars net dollars. So you can imagine when you break it down to uh, dollars per minute, it's like two to $6,000 per minute you have to do every single minute you're on. Okay, so what happens is, let's say you are a, you're selling socks, okay? Yeah. If you're selling men's socks, you know your best seller is going to be black socks, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's like a no-brainer. Yeah. So, do you only sell black socks for the next two hours? Because some black socks are not going to sell. Yeah. Right. So, what happens is you have to look for what's the next best thing, right? So, black socks you can count on, but you're like maybe white socks might work, maybe gray socks might work, maybe socks that are thinner might work. So. You count on something, but you're going to have to look for the new superstar. So yeah. like in jewelry, for example, you know, I'll go out with, let's say, a, a you know, a beautiful turquoise uh, thing that sold really well. Turquoise really hot, you know, whatever. It sold really well. You can't have eight hours of just turquoise. So what happens is like I'm thinking what goes with turquoise? You know, maybe some coral, maybe some blue topaz. Uh, maybe it could be an earring versus a ring. So what you do, though, is... If you know for a fact you can count on the turquoise to do certain because you've tested that before, yeah, um, you know you're going to buy about sixty percent, seventy percent of your in inventory based on what you sold before. But the other twenty percent, you know, I'm looking at the future big star that's going to give me two, three years of life. And so, what do I do? I can test it in an environment that I already know I'm going to meet my numbers with. Yeah. And when I already have these people tuned up and I go, you know what, if you love the turquoise, it goes really well with, with the coral. They're both opaque stones and, you know, they actually are, are complementary and color wise. It's beautiful. And by the way, it's one of the few things uh, that's natural out of the sea. Uh, basically, you know, uh, yeah. turquoise comes out of the ground and, you know, um, now maybe, you know, um, not every uh, coral is going to sell. Maybe coral isn't going to sell at all, but you'll sell something. Yeah. Right. So I'll have like six different things in that hour in that environment that I can actually test to see which one is relatively doing well. And then next time I come in, you know, maybe the, uh, the first time I try it, I'll, I'll we'll order 200 pieces of something uh, on TV. That's very, very low number. Next time, if it sells well, we might bring three other turquoise and we'll bring in a thousand units or something. And then when it really works, we'll bring in 10,000 units the next time we come in and we'll sit on that item for like a 10 minute deal. But what I just explained to you was the planned failure, because if I'm 
if I know for a fact the new thing isn't going to be the superstar, you're going to test a little bit at a time to see which one works. By design, only one or two are going to succeed really well, the testing. Yeah. And when they do even, when they do succeed, you're going to sell more, no more than 200, 300 pieces. Yeah. But you're going to get a really good lead. You know what I mean? It's like if an entrepreneur doesn't really understand plan fail, it's like when you buy a car. Yep. You're going to drive, test drive a bunch of cars. It's unthinkable to spend $50,000 on a car that you've never driven. Right? right? Like, why would, as an entrepreneur, wouldn't you check it all out? So, I think uh, as a beginner entrepreneur, understanding and accepting that failure is a necessary ingredient for you to succeed. Because if you, it's like saying, I was saying this to my son in law last night at dinner. If somebody never failed, he had a tough day yesterday. So I said, you know what? If somebody never failed, it's like saying that I'm a, um, the biggest, the, the fastest, um, you know, downhill skier. Yeah. But I've never, I've never fell. Like, I never fell. Like, that's a lie. Yeah. I think that's the power of some of this is like, there's that entrepreneurs. Whenever mm -hmm. we get the coffee shop. I mean, you know how many people would come in and say, you know, I want to, I have an idea. I want to start a coffee shop. Right. And every, can I just pick your brain? I hate that saying when people would say, can I just pick your brain? And they wanted the shortcut of how there can they no create shortcut. this? Yeah. yeah, there wasn't. And I was like, well, no, it costs lots of money and a lot of failure. And, and, you know, there's arrows in our back in what we created and they wanted to do it without the cost. And, and when you start a business as a, and as an entrepreneur, you know, the ones that are actual entrepreneurs, there's a lot of failures that we have and mm -hmm. yeah. you can see it, even as we, as you were sharing about personal branding and all of that, some of the business ideas, things we've created didn't work. Right. Uh, some of it, we didn't, maybe we didn't push hard enough. Um, but ultimately, uh, what I want to be able to do is create the business and, and the family dynamics that I want. That's why it's wealth, wisdom, financial, because wealth may not be just how many things that I sell, but it, oh, yeah, for be, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much of, you know, am I loving my family? Am I present there? Right. Right. So what does wealth mean to you? If you were to say wealth, is it, is it monetary? Like what are some of the key metrics that you look at? at in a wealthy lifestyle for you now that you came from, you know, and, and then also coming from Korea, there's probably some wealth that was there, even though they had no yeah. money, right. They probably gave you some wealth of other things, which I think you shared, but what yeah. So, yeah, I'm so glad you, you mentioned this because, um, and this is another thing I want everyone to take away from this is this. So when we came here, um, so I, I actually, you know, my, my mom was a stay at home mom. Um, mm -hmm. She had a nice life. You know, we had a, a most middle class people in Korea at the time had like a chef, like a, a cook at home, a maid. Um, yeah. So we had a couple, you know, I, we had a driver. So we had a, so my mom like took care of her five kids. And you know, so I spent every single moment I was in a school with my mom. Then I came here. My mom worked in a sewing factory, uh, two shifts a day. And so then I ended up taking care of my younger siblings. But when I, um, so when I started my company, um, so I went to school, uh, I, I graduated from UCLA, went to USC, did everything I was supposed to do. They all said, mm -hmm. you know, you got to be a lawyer, a doctor, you know, whatever, and get all these degrees and you'll be fine. I did that. And I was unhappy. I wasn't, I was emotionally exhausted. Um, I was always a creative person. And it was the corporate America, it doesn't matter whether you're in marketing or you're in finance, it, it, you know, as you know, uh, if you've yeah. done the coffee shop, and I see that in your bio, you've done, you know, your coffee shop, which I'm going to get into in a minute. It all comes down to money. It all yeah. comes down to cost um, profit ratio. Okay, yeah. so uh, at the in the beginning, I realized, okay, you know what, there is no this life I'm living is not sustainable. Because I am now paying for some lady to come and take care of my kids so I can go and work. And um, it didn't really, and I, I was working longer and longer hours. The, the more promotions I got, the longer and longer hours it became. Yeah. So I said, okay, you know what? The one thing, uh, one regret that I have uh, about my childhood, about my, my family, is the fact that I, be, 
I had no parent. I became an orphan basically at age yeah. 13, right? So that was a non-negotiable thing for me. So when I started my company, I was, I, I was willing to live on less money than what I was making in corporate America. And I was willing to work on $2,000 a month. And I didn't care if I ever owned a home or not. Yeah. Um, I didn't care if I ever like bought a new car. I was driving a Pinto, like a $2,000 Pinto that blew up like a hatchback at that time. Um, but I was willing to work two th for 2000 bucks a month, which was a lot less than what I was making before. But I wanted to work no more than 20 hours a week. And when I, um, and I thought I could do it. And then what happened was when I started my company, um, it just turns out I can't have my customers, potential customers call me from like nine to noon, you yeah. know, four days a week, right? Customers will call you at any time of the day. So I thought, you know what, this isn't, you know, like it didn't work, pan out the way I, you know, cause I'm not in an hourly position. You're in an entrepreneur space. You, you gotta be on call all the time. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Okay. What would cause me to, how could I make this work? How could I make it so that I could work 20 hours a week and I can make two grand a month? And then I broke it down to what I would need to do. Like, for example, uh, in order for me to get $2,000 a month, how many customers do I need? And in order for me to get that, 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 that many customers, what would I have to, what kind of marketing effort would I need to do to get the, the, the four or five customers I needed? Okay. So I sent out these um, like uh, letters. I went downstairs to um, like in, in the building, like in my neighborhood, there was a travel agent. They, there used to be travel agents all over the country. Yeah. Um, and I would get their book of hotels, uh, you know, airlines. They had like this giant book of, you know, things you can, so, so I ended up actually, I thought, okay, if I can work from 6 a.m. to 8, 8, 15 a.m. California time, it has to be daytime somewhere. So it just turns out that 6 a.m. is about 9 a.m. to uh, about 11 a.m. in mm -hmm. 53 countries in Western Europe, believe it or not. <laughs> so um, I thought, okay, I can work with that. So I contact, you know, so in those old days, I, uh, when you, you know, this is back in 1989, 1990, uh, we didn't have internet. So when you send something by a fax, there was a secretary that would actually take the fax and give it to whoever is supposed to get it. It's like today's text, you know, or today's FedEx package. So um, I sent, and the reason I sent the fax is not because I was smart. I actually sent the fax because I couldn't afford a phone call. A phone call was $4 a minute. A fax was like six seconds, it, you know, cut it down to like a few cents, you know, cut it down yeah. to about 60 cents. So I, I would just frantically send the faxes uh, to the buyers of Harrods London, Gary's Lafayette, um, you know, all the wonderful, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Marks and Spencer, all the wonderful stores. And lo and behold, I would get, you know, uh, so I would also send out uh, like, a, like actual letters to Neiman yeah. Marcus and Sachs and all, the, all those uh, companies, 50 letters a day I sent them out. And I did all this research when the kids were in school. Now, I, after I dropped them at school uh, about, you know, like 930 or so, I then started working East Coast, like uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, all the stores yeah. were East Coast time, three hours ahead. So I frantically worked until about two when I picked up my kids then. And from two to, you know, about 830 at night, I didn't take any phone calls. I, you know, I just basically took a, you know, uh, it just went to a recording. Yeah. And yeah. next morning I would, you know, return my calls uh, in, in that time. And to this day, I want to tell you, Brandon, I built that $500 million company never working more than 25 hours a week. Wow. So, um, so what happened was, you know, when I got to Harrods London, they are like, and those British people are just so nice. Like they don't, they have a really hard time, like sent, giving you a hard no. Yeah. So, um, you know, as soon as I get a rejection letter, they'll say, oh, you know, your things are really lovely, but we're past at this time or something. And as soon as I get that, that's when I would call. I would pick up the phone. I'd say, you know, I just got this, you know, uh, rejection letter from you. And it's like the nicest kind of rejection letter I've ever heard. But here's the other thing. When people reject you, it's normal. OK, it's yeah. not it's abnormal for them to just take you right away. It's it's because like they're already doing business with somebody. If you're selling skincare, yeah. like somebody's using skincare every day, yeah. you got to get them off of it. So it's normal for them to say no. So I would say, you know, it, it, you're so kind. I mean, I, I would say, let's say you were the buyer. I would say, Brendan, you know, uh, 
99% of the people I sent to, like, they don't bother sending me even a rejection letter, but you did. And I thank you for the time that you, you took the time to do that. Is there anything in there? Um, I sent you 30 designs. Is there anything in there that has any potential at all in the future? Like, you know, if you can give me anything that I can work on in the yeah. future, that would be so appreciative. Uh, believe it or not, people love to give you like feedback. So then, you know, about six to 10 weeks later, I would send them a bunch of new designs as, you know, Hey, it was so nice. You know, like, uh, your, your ideas were great. Um, you know, I hadn't thought about it before, but I did some more research on, on your uh, company and I see why you want this. And, you know, I'm sending you these, you know, it's a process yep. and, I'd say my hit rate, like they told me uh, that direct mail thing, like the hit rate is like uh, five to 10%. And uh, that's not conversion rate. This is a people like responding to you. And then conversion rate is even lower. Yeah. Um, I want to say my hit rate was like north of 80%. So I was hoping uh, to make two grand a month. And I ended up doing pretty close to a uh, million dollars in the first 18 months. And, and I had a global business. Now, uh, after they went to bed at 9 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, and I would help them, you know, do their homework and all that. Um, 9 p.m. Uh, California time is about noon in Tokyo, in Seoul, all right. these places. And so I opened a bunch of department stores there. So I ended up with a global business. So when I was ready to go to Neiman Marcus, um, I just told them, hey, you know, I'm already in you know, these amazing capitals, you know, Paris, Tokyo, London, um, Denmark, everywhere. And um, I mean, so then when I got on the, the I, was in, I was in the Neiman Marcus catalog like every two weeks, um, then HSN called me. And so it, it just, you know, the, the bit, so I did the business yeah. being a full-time mom, which is very rewarding. I mean, like this morning I have my grandchild here and, um, you know, I, my kid, I, I never missed a single event for them. The first trikathon, you know, that, that, that they, they were like four years old to, I did all, I drove all the field trip, you know, um, cars to their, you know, beside old soccer game, all that stuff, graduation. I never missed anything. And I think that you got to figure out what your non-negotiables are because yep. had I, Brandon, had I been like every other entrepreneur and chased everything and working twice the hours that I used to work in corporate, I probably would have never gone to, I would have, would have never opened up London or Paris or Tokyo. Yeah. I think the the things, and, and I want to like kind of land the, the ship here, um, but the couple of things that I saw and, and is your persistency, right? And taking base hits, right? I'm, I'm yeah. not a big sports fan, um, but I, you know, I look at baseball and some of that stuff. And people want home runs. They look at that and say, wow, she's a Neiman Marcus. That's amazing. Yeah, I want right. that. And they didn't don't realize the effort it took faxing every day and yeah. all of that uh, non-negotiables and reverse. So, so you did the base hits along the way. Right. And our world is all about, well, let's overnight success. You know, how did you do that? Well, uh, it was a slow process that that built up and your non-negotiables. Yeah. Uh, and then reverse engineering, you right. work backwards and saying, okay, how can I do that? And you did that Pareto principle of doing it in 20 hours as opposed to 40. Right. Because what, what happens most of the time is people are like, well, I have 40 hours and they, and they extend it and they wonder why it's not happening for them. But they, if you're focused and you only got this amount of time, you're going to do more, more, be more efficient. I think that's why my wife is a lot more efficient than I am because she, she's <laughs> very good at that whole thing and I'm not. Um, but I, I heard that and also learning like how powerful that is. And now you're teaching that. And I'm sure as you teach entrepreneurs or, or you in, invite people in, um, celebrating those small wins, yeah. um, probably that long story because you've been in this for, you know, a good long time, right? Since yeah, 30, the 80s, right? 30, 35 years. Um, that is uh, amazing of how that's built, right? Um, and your things, like what you've done, probably have changed. Right? Like the internet didn't exist. Yeah, right, right. right. Um, then so some of it goes back. And I think paper mail and all that is coming back because people are yeah, overwhelmed yeah. with all of that. But um, 
if you were to leave your uh, leave our listeners with a um, well, re- you're in jewelry. So let's do that whole like golden thing, you know, yeah. golden ring. What is the gold? The the thing that you say take this and and leave the rest. What's the main thing you would you tell everybody? Hey, this is what you need to do. You know, really make. It, a lot of people will tell you that um, I've been told that my story is inspiring. It's very mm-hmm. encouraging. Uh, it's motivational. I, I don't really want that for you. I really want you to take action because only actions yep. will result in something. Yep. And um, it's really learning um, how to pivot. I, if you listen to my story just now on this show, you learn that, you know, even with uh, like uh, uh, the ones that I opened, even those accounts that I opened, the first thing was a rejection. I got a rejection email, you know, after like I sent three faxes, I get a rejection email. Then um, you have a dialogue, you immediately thank them for the rejection, have a dialogue. And then three months later, I give them new ones and then I get rejected again. You know, you're better at this time, but, you know, uh, try this next time. So, again, you know, embracing uh, the process, uh, just discovering what's working. To me, that's the most beautiful thing that you can create something on your own. And secondly, um, Just remember, you know, you have to understand what your non-negotiables are, because when you figure out, hey, here are my boundaries and no one's going to come in here. Like when I was working 20 hours um, in the beginning, I was only working 20 hours. Um, I, you know, had to be very choosy about who I take on as a client. You know, I'm not going to tell you which, like I will say, Nordstrom's was uh, really wanted to do business with me. And, you know, their return rates were high. Um, I had to deal with like seven different buyers because the, their, their, their structure was that every region had their own buyers. So they were yeah. very inefficient for me. So I told them, you know, I'm sorry, I can't take you. Even though you're a very prestigious account and everything, I just can't take you. I can't handle you right now. I got too much on my plate. Um, and the more I said no to them, the more they wanted me. Yeah, right. And and so they actually made it kind of easy, you know, for me to deal with. So uh, really understand what you're capable of. And it's being an entrepreneur is a long process. And the sooner you embrace everything that goes with it, all yeah. the landmines you're going to have to learn to discover, all the ways you avoid it, all the ways you actually conquer it. I think that, it, that there is the beauty in that. And the other thing, too, is like you said, Brandon, um, success in my um, uh, country, success is not defined by money or fame. It's defined mm-hmm. by five things. One of those, the first thing on that order was actually your health. Without health, you don't have anything. Yep. Second yep. thing is your relationship with your immediate circle, like your parents, your kids, um, and your, you know, your siblings. Um, and third thing is wisdom, just moral compass. Um, you know, what are you willing to give up to get the rest of whatever it is? Fourth thing is um, consistency. How long can you have all those things in balance? And then the last thing in that spectrum is money. Money actually does help, you know, a few things. So um, it's kind of interesting that, you know, and um, in my family, you are not successful until you help other people be successful. And that's why, um, you know, successful people don't have to go brag about how successful they are. I mean, I still drive a Jeep. Um, you know, I can probably afford a lot of other things. Still drive a Jeep. I like it. You know, it's um, it does all the things I need. I don't get all these extra attention I don't need, yeah. you know. I don't have anything fancy on me. Um, it, you come to my podcast, Million Dollar Passion, and I created the uh, podcast because I believe that if you have passion, everything is possible. If you're just chasing money, then nothing is possible. Right. Um, that's just my philosophy. And I think that you, I have a feeling that you might agree with that. Um, and then when you come to million dollar passion, you can sign up for the free ebook. You can sign up for a lot of the free uh, webinars. Uh, most of my coaching is really for people who are already somewhat successful. I specialize in um, the eight, you know, day to nine figure people like who are trying to get to nine figures. But, yeah. you know, if you're a beginner entrepreneur, this is my public service. Um, I give you lessons on how to do storytelling, you know, being on TV for 25 years. Um, I'm pretty good at that. Uh, as far as, you know, doing your uh, personal branding, I think as an entrepreneur, if you don't understand that, you really are going to have a tough uh, road. Uh, you know, it, it's an uphill battle for you. Yeah. So, you know, that's um, just believe in yourself because nobody else will. And, um, you know, don't be surprised when you get no's and things are tough because, um, but that doesn't mean, Brandon, you have to work 
more hours to get more money. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that the the keep it simple. Um, and you know, less is more sometimes. Yeah. Well, check out you guys, uh, Victoria week. Um, that's how you say it, right? We, yeah. Wick. Wick. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, the, this is her website, victoriawick.com, W I E C K.com. And she has a lot, like there's the, the books, a couple books, uh, podcast, and, uh, I'm a subscriber there. And of course the jewelry, I think just listening to that podcast and I've listened to several episodes, it is a uh, really great. And she called out the BS. Like I heard her calling out some BS on, on it. And I think that <laughs> yeah, I did do that. What, what we need is like uh, the BS detectors out there saying, you know, honestly, like being a business owner is hard. Knowing your numbers is hard. Uh, there is no silver bullet and, and all of that, but uh, it's about all of that. So, um, go to here. She has all the, the Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, I'm sure, because, you know, jewelry, that's where you're, you do a lot of Pinterest stuff, Instagram right. and all that. But where can people find you if they, I know I just shared the website, but what's the best way, what would you want people to go get or, or listen to? Yeah, you know, listen to my podcast. Like I, I only have uh, about 28 guests a year. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I'm very, very selective on who, who they are. And my podcast is not really, it, it's more about transformation because, you know, people don't pay for information anymore. They don't need to. It's all free. Yeah. Uh, they will pay for real transformation. And I'm really involved in that. And uh, in, so come to Million Dollar Passion podcast and then you can come to, you know, milliondollarpassion.com or victoriawick.com and sign up for anything free because, um, and I, because of my time and I, I'm still on the 20, I don't, I only work really uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays th these days. Yeah. So, and half days. So obviously I can't do the free webinars all the time. I only do one a month yeah. and it's only limited to 50 people. So sign up and um, you know, anything you get there is strictly free. I don't pressure you to buy anything. Um, but I think you'll find them very valuable because I have, pay the price by making some pretty costly mistakes for 35 years. And I still make them every day, by the way. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks again for being here. Thanks for being a part of our show. Uh, I loved having you. Uh, I can't wait to be on yours uh, and, you know, drop our wisdom. Right. Um, right. And right. again, I love listening and, and hearing like you're, you're not a BS person. That's why I think we get along. Right. Uh, so, uh, and guys go check her out. Remember, don't forget to like, subscribe, uh, write a review, do all that fun stuff here on our show. Uh, and if you want more of Victoria, maybe we'll have her on again. So, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear what you have to say here. So, uh, with all that, you guys have a great one. Thanks Victoria for being here. And I'm excited to continue our relationship and, uh, and see where it leads. Thank you.